Harris. Senator yes. Kamala Harris. Senator How are Kamala you? Harris. I am very well. Good morning. Good well, morning. Well, good morning. Well, welcome back. Now you're a 2020 presidential candidate. I am. Yes. Why? Why did you do that to yourself? I'm happy you did, though. But why? You know, here's the thing. Uh, for many reasons, including this. My mother raised us with many, uh, many beliefs and rules. And one of them was don't just sit around complaining about something. Mm-hmm. Do something about it. And over the course of the last two years, I have seen, we have all seen so much that is wrong. We have seen American values under attack. We have seen the American dream under attack. We have seen babies being taken from their parents at the border in the name of border security when, in fact, it's a human rights abuse. Mm -hmm. We have seen an economy that is not working for working people. They pass this tax bill that is benefiting big corporations in the top 1%. And meanwhile... Middle class America is 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 trying to get through each month and pay the bills. That's a fact. They're, they are denying climate change. I mean, it's extraordinary what's happening, all to benefit big corporations in the top one percent, and that is not reflective of what we need, much less who we are. And that's why I decided to run. You are immediately attacked. It seems like. Like immediately, as soon as you announced it, you as know. As soon as you announced, I mean, I was so excited. Yeah. I posted the, the you know, the, the when she came up here, and we were talking to Howard in Hampton, and I was like, "This is the only Howard University alum that I'm going to support." He just wants <laughs> to remind you that Hampton is the real HU. That's you all. Know, it's it's not, you know, it's not. You know. You know. It's not about that. You right know. Right about you that know. <laughs> <laughs> but you were attacked so fast for being yes. a prosecutor, and yeah. people were upset about it. You know, what do you say to some of some of those critics? Well, first of all, look, I'm. I'm not going to ever apologize for saying that when a child is molested or a woman is raped or one human being kills another human being, that there should be serious consequence. I'm never going to apologize for that. Mm -hmm. I also believe strongly that the criminal justice system in America is deeply flawed and it must be reformed. And that's why I have dedicated myself to doing the work of one, focusing on vulnerable populations and making sure they are safe, and equally focusing on what we need to do to reform the criminal justice system. And I'm going to tell you also, when we know a system needs to be reformed, when we know it's broken, there is certainly a role on the outside. But we also should not take ourselves out of the opportunity to be on the inside and have an impact there and be an ally to what we need to do around reform from the inside. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. As a prosecutor, when I first started, it was during the height of what was happening with the Crips and the Bloods, and and mostly in L.A. Mm -hmm. And so California was passing all these gang enhancements. And I'll never forget sitting in my office where there were a bunch of folks that I worked with standing outside talking about how they were going to prove a gang enhancement, which would cause somebody to go to prison for a longer time. And they started talking about the way the person was dressed Mm -hmm. and the corner they were hanging out on and the music they were listening to. So I walked out of my office and I said, hey, so my cousins and my family, members of my family dress that way. I have family and friends who live in that neighborhood. And I've got, now I'm going to date myself, and I've got a tape of that music in my car right now. <laughs> you said, you said you a tape. Oh, yes. Okay, right. right. But these are the days mm-hmm. that when, when, I, when I created a, a reentry initiative, when I was the elected district attorney of San Francisco, focused on young men, getting them jobs and counseling. People would say to me, what are you doing? DAs would not know what reentry meant. They would literally ask me, what does the word mean? Mm-hmm. Two. People, Democrats and Republicans, would say to me, what are you doing? Your job is to put people in jail, not let them out of jail. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you another example of what it means to be inside the room. When I was DA, I cannot tell you the number of mothers, and in particular black mothers, who would come to the front window of my office, and they would say to the receptionist, I want to talk to Kamala, and I don't want to talk to anybody else but Kamala. And I would go to the window, and I'd bring them back to my office. And they would cry. And they would say, nobody is taking this case seriously. My son is dead. And they're not investigating it. They're not taking my complaint seriously. And no one is acknowledging my pain. So those are the experiences I had. Now, listen, did I get enough done? No. Did I want to do more? Absolutely. But, you know, there are people who, in this campaign for president, are definitely going to try and hit us from the right and the left mm-hmm. because they sense that we and our campaign may have strength. Does it bother you that <laughs> it seems like so many people 
that are against, you know, it's not so many people, but the people that I've seen are against look like you and look like me and look like Charlemagne, our own. That well, black, that- I think, I think, I, I get what you're saying, but I think black people just have questions for people who may not know who exactly you are. So it's just yeah. basic questions. Like, so they say, they want to know what did you do to hurt black people as a prosecutor? Because you said I, you regret some things. Well, what I regret is not having done enough. Mm-hmm. I regret not having done enough. If I had been there longer, if I had had more in terms of bandwidth, I would have done more around creating initiatives, for example, in the juvenile justice system. That was something that was always on my agenda to focus on. I didn't get to that. Mm-hmm. But I will say this, that I know also that the reentry initiatives that I created were a model well, back when I did it. Folks weren't doing it. There were mm-hmm. very few. And you can talk to a lot of elected black prosecutors today in cities around the country who will say that what I did gave them the inspiration or provided a model for what could be done by a prosecutor having the power to make the decision instead of asking somebody for permission. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say this. Look at my record in terms of being in the United States Senate. It has been a record of I am proposing that we reform America's bail system, the money bail system, and get rid of money bail. Because I know that people are sitting in jail every day in America because they can't afford to pay the $20,000 to get out while they're waiting trial. Meanwhile, the same person who committed the same kind of crime gets out if they've got the money. That's a criminal justice issue. That's an economic justice issue. I, let me tell you what I will do when I am elected president in the United States. I will put in place an attorney general who, instead of what's happening now, which is that they are shutting down pattern and practice investigations, investigations into police departments around this country that have a proven record of discrimination and racism, they're shutting those down. Those need to be reinvigorated. Consent decrees. They, I, what, my full intention would be to bring those back up, which is looking at how we need to monitor what is happening around proven racism and discrimination in the criminal justice system. So, you know, there are some people who are just going to say and that, we don't want prosecutors. There shouldn't be prosecutors. And I don't know that I'm going to be able to convince them. And I think it's, I think they think it's weird. Like they, For whatever reason, they think a black person should never lock up other black and brown people. Yeah, but, the, but here's how I feel about that, Charlemagne. Are you saying that if a child is molested, if a woman is raped, if somebody is shot down and killed? Lock no, up. they should go to jail. Well, okay, that, what color that's that's, that's yeah, right. Absolutely. And, absolutely. And, and let's not buy into the myth that black folks don't want law enforcement. We do. We don't want excessive force. Mm-hmm. We don't want racial profiling. But certainly if somebody robs, burglarizes my house, I'm going to call the police, as are most of us, mm-hmm. and say, come get this, you know what. Mm-hmm. They don't even got to go that far. If I see him sitting in the cul-de-sac too long, I'm now calling. Call <laughs> one, what's emergency? Right. But, but, but all of that being said, there is no question that, there, that this system is deeply flawed, that, that it is that there is systemic racism in the system. We have a problem with mass incarceration, in particular black and brown men. There is no question about all that. There is no question that no mother or father in America should have to sit down when their son turns 12 and start having the talk with that child about how he may be stopped, arrested, Mm -hmm. or killed because of the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. There is no question. You're right. There's no question. Have you thought about the game you're going to play with... with Donald Trump, because he's he, he plays a nasty game. You know, mm-hmm. we've seen it with Barack Obama, we've yeah. seen it with Hillary Clinton, we've seen it with everybody. So, mm-hmm. have have you started figuring out how you're going to play that game with him? Is it going to be a nasty? Is it nasty for nasty? Is it high road? Is it low road? Have you thought about that at all? Because he's going to go nasty. You know that he will. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. It's going to be this is going to be a knockdown drag out. You know, I I mentor a lot of people and I tell them, you know. The thing about breaking barriers, I gave the speech actually at Spelman and, and, and Morehouse's homecoming recently. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, the thing about breaking barriers, I want everybody to be clear about that. You may think breaking barriers means you start on one side of the barrier and then you just end up on the other side of the barrier. No, that's not how it works. There's breaking involved. And when you break things, you get hurt. And sometimes you get cut and you may even bleed. Mm. It will be worth it. It will be worth it. And then these kids were looking at me, their eyes all open. I didn't mean to scare them. And I said, look, I don't mean to scare you, but I definitely mean to prepare you. Mm -hmm. To do what we're talking about is going to involve pain, and it will be worth it. And it is also going to involve a lot of fun and joy, because that's the way I intend to run this campaign. 
I intend this campaign to be about not only the 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 standard of success being winning the election, but the standard of success also being lifting folks up, helping to organize folks, g- empowering folks along the way. And we're seeing that. And it, it didn't take my election to have that happen. We saw that even in 2018. Mm-hmm. Folks are taken to the streets. They're running for office. They're participating. It, people realized after 2016, we cannot just sit back and expect that the right thing might happen. If we do not participate, it will not happen. At least, so, at least he gave you props. He said you had a great rollout. The best yeah. rollout of all the candidates. Yeah, well, he likes crowd size, and I had a big crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I want to talk to you, because I, I, I hear everything you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but some people, it'll go over their head. So I want to address some of these memes. Okay. Because this is how I see the false information yeah. getting out. There's a meme that says, Kamala Harris broke the state record for incarcerating black males. Well, that's just not. You know what a meme is, correct, right? Yes, I okay. do. Don't date, I come do. on now. Don't date her like that. Come no, on now. You know, he went to Hampton. He doesn't know that. He <laughs> doesn't know. He doesn't know. You, you, you do mixtapes. I, I was I talking about that was how long ago it was I know, I know. that I've been in this, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're saying the meme is bullshit. I'm saying that, it, listen, there are going to be all kinds of allegations being made. And I, I invite and I... Not only invite, I encourage folks to look at the real record. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be people who um, are they they want to own and and a certain territory in politics, and they are concerned that I understand the issues, and so they're going to try and hit below the belt. And I just the only thing I can ask is that that voters and and everyone be um, informed and educated. But listen. The bottom line, Charlemagne, is that my role in the work that I have done has always been about representing the people. Mm-hmm. And as a prosecutor, it was about what we need to do to correct the system. And I stand by that record. I stand by that record. You know, another meme says, uh, Kamala Harris is not African-American. Her parents were immigrants from India and Jamaica, and she was raised in Canada, not the United States. <laughs> and it said, Fact! Uh-huh. That's what the meme said. So I was born in Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and raised in the United States, except for the years that I was in high school in Montreal, Canada. And look, this is the same thing they did to Barack. Yes. This is it, this is not new to us. And so I think that um, we know what they're trying to do. They're trying to do what has been happening over the last two years, which is powerful voices trying to sow hate and division among us. Mm -hmm. And so we need to recognize when we're being played. I'm glad you mentioned Barack, because a lot of black people question if Barack was black enough. I see them doing the same thing to you. So what do you say to the people questioning the legitimacy of your blackness? I think they don't understand who black people are. Mm. Because if you do, if you walked on Hampton's campus, or Howard's campus, or Morehouse, or Spelman, or Fisk, you would have a much better appreciation for the diaspora, for the diversity, mm-hmm. for the beauty in the diversity of who we are as black people. So I'm not going to spend my time trying to educate people about who black people are. Because mm. right now, frankly, I'm focused on, for example, an initiative that I have. It's called the LIFT Act that is about lifting folks out of poverty. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the fact that in the United States today, uh, almost the majority of American families who are making under a hundred thousand dollars a year as a family are a four hundred dollar unexpected emergency away from what could be disaster. Wow. Which is why I'm proposing that there be a six thousand dollar tax credit that they can collect at five hundred dollars a month. Recognizing five hundred dollars a month makes all the difference between being able to get through that month without worrying, much less catastrophe. I'm focused on the fact that in the United States today. In 99% of the counties in America, if you are a minimum wage worker working full time, you cannot afford market rate for a one bedroom apartment. Those are the things I'm focused on. How can we turn it around? I, you know, I, I do a lot with real estate and I notice a lot of, of black people can't afford. They can't get a loan. It's very right. difficult. They, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to get mm-hmm. a, a small business loan. How can we help black people and minorities get more loans and get housing and not have to rent apartments for 40 years That's and, right. and actually own something? That's right. Well, so for example, the, on the rent piece, mm-hmm. but I'll go, I'll go back to the, the piece about the families making less than $100,000 a year. Mm-hmm. My proposal is about reforming the tax code. 
of this country. And by doing that, we know that we will lift 60 percent of black households out of poverty with this initiative. Mm -hmm. When you look at the issue of rent, what I am proposing is that we also recognize that if people are paying over 30 percent of their income in rent plus utilities, they should get a tax credit. Mm -hmm. Because to your very point, folks are are struggling to pay the rent or pay the mortgage Mm -hmm. and are barely holding on. And what we know in particular for black families is that the greatest source of our economic stability or wealth and the greatest asset we have financially is our home. And we take a great deal of pride in that because we are about the American dream, Mm -hmm. right? And part of the American dream is you work hard, you play by the rules, you should be able to afford a home that will be your peace and where you will tend to that lawn and it will be your pride and it will represent your ability to put your children through college or retire with dignity. And too many people don't have access to that. So specifically then, when I'm elected president, Part of it will be what we need to do around the housing and urban development, HUD. I love how you spoke because, that into fruition, too. So absolutely. When I'm elected president. Right. I intend on winning. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I just want to be really clear about that. And I know it will not be easy. And I know there's going to be a lot thrown in our way, and this will not be given to us. Absolutely. But on HUD, mm-hmm. so part of what we have gotten away from is understanding that folks, again, need a lift up, right? And it's not a handout. It's 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 just giving folks a hand. Right. And so that's about what we do, not just not only about credits in terms of, you know, Section 8 housing, and all that, but what we do to create incentives for, for home ownership. And that's something that's very much a part of my agenda. Now, also, I wanted to ask, you know, with Barack Obama, when he was in office, a lot of African-American people felt like he didn't do anything for black people. Yeah. They felt like he did everything for, you know, the LGBT community. He did things for, you know, Spanish community, Latinos, but do, nothing for African-Americans. Yeah, so do you have an agenda for black voters? Of course I do, but I, I also want to stand up for Barack Obama on that mm-hmm. because, you know, first of all, none of us can do enough, and we all know that. If you are a parent raising a child, you know we can never do enough. Right. As leaders, we can never do enough. It's important to acknowledge that. Um, but let's not let let's also give people credit for what they've accomplished. I was just meeting yesterday and the day before with um, the presidents and chancellors of HBCUs, mm-hmm. and we were talking about how under the Obama administration, for example, they extended Pell grants, right, mm-hmm. which our kids really rely on to get them through school, right. and extended it so it wouldn't just be for the school year but through the summer. We can talk about what under President Obama happened in the Holder Justice Department around getting rid of the the mandatory minimums and in particular the crack and powder cocaine disparities Mm -hmm. and also those those investigations, pattern and practice investigations, so much. So and a continuation of that would be part of my agenda. The black agenda has to include HBCUs Mm -hmm. and looking at the, the, the historical fact that when the federal government gives attention to HBCUs, we end up having a profound impact on black people in America. I think the numbers are something like almost 60% of black professionals in America have come from HBCUs, either in undergrad or graduate school. So that is part of it. Part of it is what I was describing about focusing on families that are making less than $100,000 a year. Part of it is focusing on what we need to do around reform of the criminal justice system, understanding that the mass incarceration policies of this country have led to black and brown men in particular mm-hmm. being incarcerated at, 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 at ridiculous rates proportionate to their representation and proportionate to the fact that that when you look at similarly situated other people, they're not getting arrested and prosecuted and sentenced to the same kind of numbers. There's what we need to do around also dealing with public health matters. One of my initiatives and a bill I have is around maternal mortality. Mm. Black women are dying at three to four times a higher rate in connection with childbirth in America. And it's tragic because when you look at it, it, this is not an issue of the educational level of these women. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue of their socioeconomic situation, right? Look at Serena. Look what happened. It it literally is about it it is literally about racial bias in the healthcare delivery system. And so I have an initiative that is, and it's a bill 
that says that, one, we need to train medical schools and doctors on how to take black women seriously when they walk through that hospital door and talk about um, their, their, their illness and, and take them seriously and not reject their, their complaints or, or think of them as hysterical. Um, so there is that. There is- I, I experienced that last year with my wife when she had her, her third daughter. Because it's like we went to the hospital. They had no epidurals. Yeah. Like she had to give a natural childbirth, didn't want to, lost a lot of blood. Really? Yeah. And I'm like, mm. why? Like you knew we were coming. Right. It was just like it was almost like a, oh, well, we don't have any epidurals. So you you want to push it out, push it out. Like, wow. I'm so sorry. Yeah. What the hell? What hospital was that? I don't want to say that. But um, and you know yeah. people, and you're not. Right, and I got right, a little change. And you're right, yeah. right, right, <laughs> right, yeah. right. So the you know so the the issues that range th- that are that exist that need to be addressed and, and prioritized include everything from education to the healthcare system to the criminal justice system to the economy. And I will also say this: that that people need to understand that when we talk about the agenda for Black America. That that is about America's agenda. It needs to be about America's agenda. You know, I I'll tell you, it's been interesting. I actually gave a speech at Net Roots Nation um, a few months ago on the issue of um, identity politics. Mm-hmm. You know, because I, I I've been disturbed by how people are using this phrase identity politics because mm-hmm. they use it in a way that is to basically have you shut up when you're talking about issues of race or gender or sexual orientation. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that's identity politics. Right. You're playing that card. And here's my point. Let's not be shut up when we're talking about civil rights issues, because the way that we handle and address those issues is a statement about who we are as Americans and our identity as Americans. The way we treat black people in America is an indication of America's identity. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear about that one. Two, and this is what I find to be very interesting as well. Um, I am on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I'm on Senate Homeland Security Committee. So we 